Vamos aproveitar o intervalo do seu podcast pra falar sobre K-pop. Preciso contar uma coisa pra vocês. Que você faz dancinha no TikTok? <risos> ah, isso não vai me surpreender. Mas o menu exclusivo do Mac com personagens do BT21 vai. Tem o novo Mac Crispy Chicken Cajun, molho Sweet Chili e Cajun e os personagens BT21 pra você levar pra casa. Opa, depois do programa eu vou lá no app pedir porque eu vi que os combos estão com frete grátis, né? Clica aí no banner e pede agora mesmo. É por tempo limitado. Vai! Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author Sam Baker. My guests this week have both lived fascinating lives. Both are now 55 and have found themselves in this place in life that has brought them a surprising new power. Actress, producer, businesswoman and compulsive learner Sadie Frost and award-winning actress and singer-songwriter Frances Ruffell first met at school in 1976 and have been firm friends ever since. I mean, I think um, I would be happy to marry Sadie, basically. <laughs> <laughs> we are like an old marriage. But that's not going to work for us both. Because <laughs> we love each other, but not in that way. I zoomed in with the lifelong besties to talk about how their 45-year friendship is more important than any marriage. Being in the middle of the muddy soup of menopause and why Sadie's looking forward to finally leaving home at 55. I also got raging house envy. Well, it's brilliant. Thanks for coming on The Shift, Sadie and Francis. I can see an amazing bed behind your head. Yes, I'm in my bedroom. It's my sanctuary. I'm in North London. It's, yeah, my kind of uh, place of peace and quiet in heaven, and it's a very spiritual little place for me with incense burning, a bit of calm in, in a crazy, crazy world. So it's a nice Indian bed behind me. It's beautiful. Is it? Where's it from? Is it? Yeah, it's from, I think it's from India. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, and Francis, where are you? I'm in my living room, which is also quite, you know, sanctuary-like. I have these sort of Moroccan shutters. Oh, yeah. Lovely. And very 70s style chair. It's very sort of a cross between urban and hippie. <laughs> oh, my God, I've got interiors envy. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> And you, you live near each other, don't you? Literally around the corner. We're um, practically neighbours, and um, uh, which is really handy because we can, you know, uh, meet on the park. We're right by um, by a park, so we can go for walks together and share a. Do- we should kind of share a dog, which is quite nice as well. Yeah. And also, um, I live half the time in the States. Obviously, right now, that's mm. difficult. So when I come back, <laughs> um, I often live with Sadie as well. So we sort of live together quite a lot. I wanted to start by talking about your friendship, really, because you've been friends since the 70s, is that right? Since school? 76, we met at school yeah. and um, we were in all the same classes and we um, were training dance together, ballet, jazz, tap, acting, speech, elocution. We were kind of like, I think we were like the two rascals of... of uh, yeah, the two scruffy ones that always went to school with unironed clothing. Yeah, and um, well, I was from Camden and, and Francis was from... East London. So we kind of really stood out. I think we had extra elocution lessons given to us. Um, <laughs> and uh, we hit off straight away because I think we were the naughtiest kids in the class, really. Yeah. And also, uh, we used to make up dances and things from that age. So it's kind of like we're, we're still doing the same thing all these years later. It's like you've come full circle, really. Yeah. We have come full circle and, and mirrored each other's. And we, we kind of got married at around the same time and had children at the same time. And our lives have had a lot of synergy. Yeah, in and out, even down to the back. We both lived in L.A. at the same time, didn't we? And that was a coincidence. Have you been friends like solidly through that time? Or is it one of those things that's come and gone as your lives have converged and diverged? Maybe. You know, I'd be traveling or France be traveling where our lives just took us, you know, to different places. But we've never, it's not like she disappeared from my life ever. No. So how does your friendship now in your 50s compare to the beginning, to to friendship in your 30s? How has it evolved? Well, I think right now, I think we're in very similar places. I think I was very um, jealous of Frances being the out, out the other side of parenting. She had three kids, I had four. And Frances kind of got her freedom a lot quicker than I did because she she didn't have the fourth child. So I still have my kids all living at home. Well, you know, two of them at home and they come back. And I mean, I love my children, do not get me wrong. And they mean everything to me. But I've watched Frances have the freedom and, and like really 
really good that um I can see that we're we're both got a bit more freedom. My my youngest is doing his A levels, so I can make a choice like Francis and go and live in LA or or go and live in another country on my own. So it's like I'm at that time now where I'm finally leaving home. Um so <laughs> we can kind of we have adventures together without husbands, without children, without careers, really. And we're both at a crossroads in our life, which often happens with women in their 50s, I guess, mm. where we are making new decisions and going in a different direction in our life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I feel so lucky. It's been five years since, you know, I, I've basically um, been in New York most of the time the last five years and I have had more freedom and Sadie, I have seen you looking at me and wanting to have the same <laughs> situation. Um, but also what's been nice, and it's been longer than the five years, I think pretty much all our adult life is that when we travel together or go on holiday together, we're good partners for that. I mean, I think um, I would be happy to marry Sadie, basically. <laughs> <laughs> we are like an old marriage but that's not going to work for us both because <laughs> we love each other but not in that way um but we get on really really well sort of traveling we've done a lot of traveling together and we've met all around the world basically and we know that it's something in the future that possibly we might end up moving in together in little bungalows in india or something we've got a lot of the same interests as well so that has just helped both of us obviously being um you know performers me acting and, and, and France acting and singing and dancing and doing things together. And I think our children have all been friends and gone to the same schools. So there's been parallels within our yeah. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. It's really interesting because the number of women that I've spoken to, north of 40, shall we say, but particularly the women in, in their 50s and above, who kind of say things broadly like you just said, Francis, which is that I kind of wish that I could marry my girlfriends because, you know, they give me everything except sex. And unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not that way inclined. And loads of people have said to me, like, I really kind of wish I was, but I'm, I'm yeah. just not. Do you both find that your, your female friendships and your, your close friendship is more important now almost than a marriage yeah <laughs> definitely I think I think as well as you get older well for me I've got less and less friends you know I my family's very important and, and my kids and um and I have a few very close female friends I got really bored of socializing quite a while ago because my career has been so busy with different things whether it's been producing or directing or the yoga collection so I'm a bit of a workaholic and I think Francis is as well. So my friendships with my girlfriends are like really important. I don't really go out for many dinner parties. And so my girlfriends are important to me. What is really important to me right now, and I never thought I'd be this person because I always had to be around hundreds of people. That's what I liked, is I love my space. You know, I need my space. So I think having a friend like Francis and, and being together, we both know that we need our space. So I'll say, right, I'm going to read a book now, see you in a day or yeah. <laughs> or a box set. So we both are very similar like that. So it's good that we can respect each other's um, likes and dislikes. Is that something that's changed as you've uh, got older? For me, you know, I, I, I like to be with people 24-7. I would always have like one of the kids in the bed or um, lots of sleepovers with friends. I always want people like coming and staying but now I just like, yeah, I really like being on my own, I like going for walks on my own. I like going for dinner on my own or lunch. I really like being on my own. Um, and that's really changed in the, you know, in the last four or five years. What about you, Francis? I feel like um, my life has been very, very sociable, but I've never wanted it to be as sociable as it is. And I shouldn't be ungrateful. Um, but being in the theatre and everything, and you meet so many different people. And plus, people who kind of want to hang out with you because they're interested in your life, which is lovely. But at the same time, I've always felt it was too much. And I craved to be alone a lot of the time. And I love my space alone. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, when I didn't have a home and I was living with Sadie, I noticed how often we took ourselves to bed quite early in obviously separate beds. And um, we just wanted to have that little me time, you know. I think we are similar like that. And also both of us are working so hard. I write all the time as well. I've got so many projects that I'm writing. I just never have time to finish them all. I need more time alone. Sadie, I've read that you said that you've been worrying about the domestic stuff for 30 years and now is like a time to stop worrying about that. You know, I have so much domestic stuff to do around me right now. It's just because of, I, I guess, the nature of lockdown. You know, I'm really nearly mm. out the other side. But there's a lot of changes, you know, 
you know, at some point moving from my, you know, the house that I brought my kids up into a smaller place and maybe relocating to the countryside or, uh, you know, not being in, in London. So there's still a lot of um, tidying up to do. I've got my kids and two stepchildren, so six to 10 kids around, um, which is a lot of work. And luckily, oh my God. Um, Francis has been around to help me. I've been helping, yes. Washing up and stuff. But we all love a moan. I mean, it's so annoying, like the way we all moan. And that, but that's part of the human condition. And I try to practice not moaning and not being negative because I have a lovely family and, and, and lovely kids and everything's good. But we, I moan about cleaning and, and that's been, my children hate me for it because they just think I'm just really annoying. Are they doing any cleaning though? They think they are. <laughs> that's diplomatic <laughs> that's a kind of a familiar lockdown scenario for a lot of women isn't it oh my god I've got kitchen envy now Francis sorry <laughs> Francis is moving around I'm like, oh my god in the beginning of lockdown when when it first happened I was cleaning up so much that after the first week I slipped slipped a disc in my back because I was picking <laughs> Sorry, this is my um, sausage dog envy. This is my little baby. Oh, a girl, is it Cherry? Cherry, yeah, guard dog. So I picked up so many pairs of socks and pants off the floor, I think for the first week or so, and then I, my back <laughs> was in bed for a month. Yeah, so when I had um, menopause in my, started that Perry thing in my mid 40s, and I just like, I knew nothing about it. And I was kind of afraid of it because I thought, right, that's it. I'm finished now. I'm more or less the same age as you guys. And now I'm in my mid-50s. I've just like, hang on, this is great. I find it's better here. Mm. How has it been for you? I've always found um, whatever the hormone is incredibly frustrating, whether it's um, PMT or postnatal, you know, my hormones affect me hugely. Whatever you're kind of, you know, going through in a time of your life, you're going to be affected by hormones and and there's ups and downs. But I don't think I'm out the other side of anything yet. And I'm in a kind of muddy soup of just like sorting my head out and decisions. I'm still very much in the middle of things going on within me. There's a lot of thinking to be done and kind of reflection and challenge yourself and you know you can make a decision you know you can either become like a very wise person and very gracious you see women some women going that way and you see other women kind of really falling to pieces and becoming very bitter and neurotic or you know like doing yoga or meditation whatever you're doing it's a daily practice of just feeling you know fulfilled and liberated and hopeful and in tune with yourself it's hard work to feel okay and good. And that's that's been my experience throughout my life. Um, and I just see this stage of your life is very important to to really come to terms with a lot of things that you've experienced. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Because I heard you uh, say, I was listening to a podcast earlier, saying that being a 50-year-old woman is a time of facing yourself, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. That's exactly what it is. It is like facing yourself and you still feel like part of you or part of me, you know, one minute I could feel like a a young girl, 15 year old. And the next minute I'm feeling like, you know, a wretched 50 year old who's like, you know, oh my God, aches and pains or whatever. But then, you know, it's just joining the two together and just being complete and being whole and facing yourself and trying to be the best version of yourself you can ever be you know, whether you've experienced, you know, grief or divorce or, you know, I'd like to be a good role model for people around me, young, younger people and, you know, my, my kids and girls and boys and their friends. And I think it's about, you know, not look just looking at yourself, but really looking outwards. And that's what I try to do. But when I start looking too inwards and it's about me, you know, like if I'm worrying about my problems and like how I'm feeling about myself or I'm getting old or think about death or whatever it could be you know it you know you literally can go down that tunnel and go into a really dark place so you have to do all these things that you're know, trying to find the light in your life whatever it may be and that's why you know I can spend an hour two hours a day meditating and doing yoga and if I don't do that I can be a mess and I can be grumpy and all of that stuff so I'm facing everything all those fears and all of that stuff and it's good to have a friend like Francis who we kind of doing certain things together and you know and it's nice to you, you kind of partner up with people who are on the similar journey journey to you you know and and that's the people I want to be around if I see someone's completely course opposites are good but if I see somebody who's completely out of sync with me it makes me feel quite uncomfortable I don't have time to go there (laughs) Francis how has it been for you yeah well um I was very early 
with the menopause actually and I didn't even realize I was going through it I never had PMT so I was very lucky actually I had a really rather young boyfriend at the time who pointed it out to me that I was rather thanks hot, and not in such a good way <laughs> I, I was like no don't be so ridiculous and, and then I realized he was absolutely right and it was a bit of a shock because I was, I was 39 Holy. So it was such a shock. So it was hard to sort of face at first. And then I had to face it. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to deal with it. And actually, I feel great about it now. Um, I think I was quite secretive with a lot of people about it. It was like mm. a stigma at first. I'm feeling as I get older, I'm more open about absolutely everything. I don't feel like I have to hide anything. And, and it doesn't really matter about what other people think because nobody's really thinking about you anyway. They're only thinking about themselves. True. So, so um, yeah, for me, it's okay. I mean, I, the only thing I found recently, actually, is that I don't sleep much. And that's been hard. Mm. But that's the only only thing I'm worried about. As well as the whole the physical signs. If you feel like you've been through a kind of an emotional shift for want of a better way of putting it yes I have I didn't put the two and two together with menopause I just think it's an age thing really I think men feel it too I just feel so much more confident in my life even though you know I I can look in the mirror and I can pick myself apart Mm. but actually I still feel so much more confident about myself and more open and more happier way more content with my life than I've ever felt ever and even through this lockdown even though I'm not able to put my theatre work up in the theatre I still feel really calm and content most of the time. That's really interesting have you found I mean obviously nobody's performing through this last year but have you found before that that your work had been affected as you aged? No not really because I made a conscious decision to only write and perform things I've written in. And so I'm not really seeking work. If someone was to offer me something I really want to do, I do it or I do favors for people. But no, I, I feel like I feel much more empowered in my life, that I'm much more in control. Is there a sense for you that you write in the parts that you want to see? Yeah, the first thing I've written was for myself, basically, if I put it very quickly her journey to, to empowerment and contentment. So actually, sort of very much my own life story but sort of mixed in with other stories. Sadie you lived your life on the stage whether it's the theatre or um, you know the kind of more reluctant public stage. How have you felt that that has changed as you've kind of progressed through your life? I was very driven when I was younger to I love acting and, and performing and being in that world but so I started a film company and my fashion company quite a few years back and you know, more and more, I, I wanted to be just either on the business side, behind the scenes. Um, you know, I'm producing and directing, working with actors, kind of putting things together, being proactive in a business way. And, you know, I like all of it. And I like having the variety. You know, I've done two films, in, you know, during lockdown and, and they're coming out and stuff. But I guess I like the variety. But and I don't think I ever really liked being in the public eye, you know, when people are making things up about you or having a perception of you. A lot of my life was lost because people made my life into something it wasn't. And it and you know, and that affected me because in that that part of my life, when I was younger, I was incredibly sensitive and I really cared. And you know, when I was suffering from postnatal depression and there was a lot of things that were written that weren't true, um, it really hurt me, really scarred me and and it and it affected my life. I, you know, for a good five years. And I think what I had to do was just become really tough, you know, and it was painful to become that tough because I'm a very gentle, vulnerable person. So I had to kind of grow this kind of thick skin to kind of get through people having an opinion on me that, I mean, at least now you have social media where you can kind of say, someone's written this about me today. That's a load of rubbish. You know, you know, people writing the biggest load, you know, people just being awful. A lot of the stuff that happened then you couldn't get away with now. You know, when I look at it and I think, oh my God, that was happening when I was my daughter's age or my son's age. And Mm -hmm. and you just look at them and how innocent and all they're just trying to do is just kind of get on and have a relationship or work hard or build something for themselves and and just that kind of very um, negative poisonous toxic thing of knocking someone down so what is important to me is you know being in the countryside being in nature which always has been eating lovely vegetarian food being around kind people 
having lovely kids, working, helping other people is so important to me. And all of that stuff that sometimes comes in that world on, on being on the stage and having a public image, you know, is, is not so interesting. But, you know, it, it's good to have had both. And, and now I'm just like a little bit more subdued, I guess. Because when you were talking earlier about taking time for yourself and getting through the fog, you know, and mm. doing, you know, the ways that you cope, do you think you developed those because of what you went through in your 20s and early 30s? Yeah, I, th- I think to a degree. And I and I think I, I just don't want to waste any more time on, tri- you know, trivial, shallow things. You know, I, I just don't suffer fools gladly. I have a certain amount of tolerance. You know, I, I have a lot to do. There's a lot of good things going on. And I'm like, well, actually, I just want to you know, sit down and eat a meal with my family rather than talk about rubbish or be part of rubbish or anything toxic. It's just, I've just no time for it. I just kind of guess you, you see how much time was wasted over really stupid, toxic things. And then you think, well, I'm just not interested anymore. You know, I, I was always very trusting of people and, and that a lot of people's intentions are not good, you know, and that's sad that you have to learn by kind of being burnt or, or going through you know, it's human nature, isn't it? That we have to experience these things. So you, by experiencing them, you come out hopefully better, stronger, brighter. You realise in the end, you know, your family, my sisters and my mum and my close friends are the most important people to me and just protect that, really. Yeah, totally. And I definitely think from the, you know, the number of women I've spoken to for this podcast who've reached that point where they kind of thought I spent a lot of in my 20s or 30s just, you know, worrying about what people thought of me, you know, stressing about what people were saying about me saying yes when I really want to say no, you know, all of that stuff. And it's really taken until now to get to a point where you go, I'm not doing that. Mm, We need therapy in learning how to say no. Yes. (laughs) Totally. We've touched on both of your kind of incredibly prolific careers and doing loads of everything, actually, both of you. So do you think the fact that you've done so many different things has helped you stay focused and working and doing what matters to you? I think it's great that we've both had um, lots of different choices, but we make our opportunities because both of us child actors and then your career, you know, your career goes up and down and then it's hard and, 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 you know, that kind of stinking feeling of not being wanted or not being hired. You know, we both went out and made our opportunities. You know, I went back and did an MA and studied uh, film production and constantly um, learning new skills, whether I went and did a, just did a director's course because I directed a documentary and just doing things, you know, getting an idea, you know, to go back to school, even in your 50s, which I did last year and I did this documentary course. Now I'm doing a cinematography course. I'm just doing more and more things that I find interesting. And then, you know, there is time to do all that stuff. And then I, I want to learn. And and then, you know, I guess I'm not getting bored and, and just having a variety of things. There's part of me that looks at once I've done everything I wanted to do, then just doing nothing. But everyone laughs when I say they were like, no, you're never going to just do nothing. But I mean, I know I just want to learn how to bake a cake because I don't think I've ever really done that. So, that's you know, like <laughs> that kind of stuff I have, you know, baking. That's one thing I've never done. Yeah, I'm very lucky to have these opportunities and do different things. Um, but I'm looking forward to doing nothing at some point. I never, ever get bored. There's always something to do because I'm always coming up with some different idea, some creation, writing music. Yeah, like Sadie, I, I can't imagine actually having time to do nothing. And I kind of do think, oh, next month I'll take the month off and I'll just sit here and do nothing. I'll catch up with all the box sets. I'll do all that stuff. It never, ever happens. And at this yoga thing that we're doing together, Yin and Ton, it was grown out of just a natural situation, wanting to practice yoga together in lockdown and um before we know it, it's taking over our lives you know <laughs> yeah tell me some more about that well yin and tonic um came about because well sadie and i've always done yoga together sadie introduced me to yoga at a very young age and so i felt in lockdown that i was looking on youtube trying to find uh, yoga practices or workouts mm-hmm. and it was mainly workouts that were to pumping beats and i was trying to keep myself fit And then I realized the sort of music was sort of adding to my anxiety levels, um, which I think we all had in the first lockdown. So I was thinking there was something missing. We need to work out to sort of mindful beats rather than mindless beats. So that's how the the idea sort of came together. And then Sadie and I, um, as we always practice together, 
decided to practice together on Zoom and everything together. And then um, when we were allowed to, we became a bubble. And then we started practicing together to the, the original yin and tonic music that we've created. And so now we're it's just got bigger and bigger. And we've, we've started, I think we've done six videos now, haven't we, Sadie? Yeah, we've done six. Yeah. Um, six or seven. I think we started doing these little yoga routines and then the kids started doing them with us or, or close friends and you know we'd send the, a link to them they could they could practice and people started liking it and we just wanted to share some connection and some love and also what's great about it is you have these little routines and then you have Francis speaking you through how to do them and you have this lovely music it's something they wanted people to discover for themselves it's very you know, it's very organic and we're not trying to be perfect. And for me, you know, perfection is kind of realizing what your imperfections are. And, you know, I'm never going to be a certain way. All, all our bodies are different. All our practices are different. I'm always going to have a stiff back because I've always had a, prob- a back problem. A lot of the time we are looking on Instagram and some everyone's doing these crazy, crazy poses. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. But, you know, yeah. they, they might have been a dancer when they were four or they might be hypermobile. And the whole thing about our practices, it's kind of, you know, there's different for different levels, but some of it isn't too challenging, but it's just gentle and beautiful and about you can do it anywhere. And, you know, it becomes part of your day, like brushing your teeth and something just to check in and, and connect with another human being. Our main signature yoga practice, which is 20 minutes long, is, is called the Sunshine Set. And it is quite a simple routine. The only thing is Sadie and I have practiced dance, so we are very, very flexible. So sometimes to others, it can look a bit scary, but it's really not. And it's not about lifting your leg as high as we do. It's really about just doing what feels right for you. And and, and, it, and more importantly, stay comfortable in your body. We've created these practices for busy people that don't want to do more than 20 minutes, 15 minutes, happy hearts, 15 minutes long. And that's a sort of proper workout. Actually, it's a strong workout. But again, to mindful music. But basically, it's more about just dipping in and out, having fun. But you can even just listen to the music and watch the yoga and make it a sort of sensual thing. We have also on YouTube, we have the yoga without the instruction. So you can just hear the music. And with the instruction, I will say that the instruction is very limited. It's very simple and to the point so that the music can shine through. But also, if you want to redo something or check something, you can always rewind, you know, because we're just sharing our practice, not teaching. It's not, we're not teachers as such, even though we've trained as teachers. I've wow. trained as a um, Ashtanga yoga teacher. And Sadie... In- Kundalini dance and Kundalini yoga um, addiction therapy. But, you know, so you do you do certificates and your teacher training. So I do a lot of Kundalini and Kunda dance. And I've yeah, been doing yoga for, since I was 16. So how many years is that? Many. And I've a lot. Um, but got teacher training in, in two different types of, of yoga. Um, but more, more than anything, it's not really about us teaching. It's it's sharing the practice, and and we do actually say that it's um, really for people that have had some yoga experience. But mm-hmm. you could do it if you've not had yoga experiences as, as well. It's just that I don't explain everything completely like a proper yoga class. Mm-hmm. But we're trying to fit this in in twenty minutes so that you can get used to it and do it every day. So it's like a practice that will make your body and mind feel great. You know, to to fit in twenty minutes a day is not hard. So if you're someone like me who was like the least flexible kid in school, like literally couldn't touch my toes when I was six or seven, let alone now. I mean, now it doesn't even bear thinking about. So I've been to a lot of yoga classes, but I've never really stuck at it because I've always felt like that competitive thing. Mm. you know. And I know yeah. everybody always says it's not competitive. It's not about them. It's about you. And I know all that, but you still find yourself looking at the woman who can like do the, what's the really hard one? The crow. Oh, and yeah. I can just about do the child's pose, you know. <laughs> I think the sunshine set, it's really, I really liked it because you can just like watch it a few times and get and get the gist of it. And it, it's short, so you can keep doing it, you know. When we've taken the instructions away and it's just the music and the yoga, it's like a little short film. I mean, we call it the yoga film. But it is meant to be very relaxing. And a friend of mine said, I don't really know much about ASMR. Do you know about that? It's kind of like they people sort of whisper stories. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, it's meant to make you feel good and tingly. But my friend watched our yoga film 
and said, oh, my God, it's so ASMR. And I, obviously, so I had no idea what it is. So I think we have a hashtag now that says unintentionally ASMR. <laughs> I'm going to watch it when I get off with that in mind, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, tune into the one without the instruction then. That's much more relaxing. Fitness is it's a, a huge thing for women around this kind of stage of life and I think I mean I don't know about you guys but there's a point when it kindly clicks in your head that maybe strength is more important than being thin absolutely I think it's very important to be feeling good that you're you're healthy and your body's not aching I you know a few years ago there was I had a scare where I thought well they thought I had like rheumatoid arthritis but in the end it was some kind of weird immune infection where everything was painful so if I got out of bed and I walked on the floor my feet hurt or everything was hurting just aching I was like oh my god this is old age and you know I was just like oh my god I feel it was so much pain and then it's just to be pain free and that you know that you're supporting your bones you need you know strength to support your bones and to be eating a diet you know and it's just crazy that if people are constantly dieting to maybe three times a year you could wear some dress that you want you know I was slim and skinny early on in my life but that was just how I was and now it's like I'm not going to be constantly fighting staying slim I mean I'm not going to win that but I am this shape now and I should just celebrate this shape this is how I am I do a lot of exercise I'm healthy I eat well what you realize now is that everything you're doing you know you're doing for yourself it's not like I'm in some you know fad where I drink green juice or I'm seen at this class or I'm doing this because that's cool you know Everything you do in your day, from the moment you wake up and you open your eyes and whether you're doing meditation or being on the phone all day and wasting time or doing something constructive, everything you do is you're putting everything in the bank for yourself, emotionally, spiritually, physically, whatever. And that's how I see my day. So if somebody, you know, wants to do something that is going to take away me having the time to put that in, you know, and and also I'm talking about happiness as well with your family and friends. But if if something's taking away from that and I'm not going to be able to put everything in the bank, health bank or whatever it is you're doing all day to make yourself feel good, then it's a negative thing and I shouldn't do it. So that's how I just see it, really. Let's talk about um, as well your other coping me- mechanisms. Obviously, there's the yoga, and you're pretty. You're both pretty religious about doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What What else keeps you sane? Going for walks is really important for me, and I haven't had one today. I woke up this morning, like Francis. I'm a really bad sleeper, and I woke up at three thirty a.m. this morning. Oh. I've always been a bad sleeper, like literally since I had kids. And I put on an insight timer and I listened to that one yoga nidra and then I did another one. Then there's one really interesting and you get it on YouTube. It's guided Vipassana and the man's voice, he describes what it is. And he's got this amazing Indian voice. And then there's a bell every five minutes. Now that will just chill me out, relax. And I let fell back to sleep for half an hour. I need that. I need the link. You've got to remember to send it. Yeah. Down. <laughs> Honestly, I'm in the same thing where I'm listening to these online apps, right? And every now and then I find one that's lovely and the voice is lovely. Then I can't find it again. And I go through all these different recordings and I can't believe how many things say on these apps this is for you to go to sleep and then the voice is just like ow (laughs) (laughs) really irritating Uh, I think as well because I go to bed early so I wake up early but 3 a.m is crazy but when you go on those apps if you really find a good one you can put a heart by it and it'll save it so it'll remember ah there you go so that's what you do <laughs> but, so walking meditation oh yeah so I have a little thing so if I get quite wound up about stuff and you know and anything can trigger that you know um, and I'm a quite a reactive person when I'm in my kind of reactivity that's not healthy so a friend of mine said make a little god box so I have a little god box which I need to be using more And I did give them to people for Christmas. And basically, so if I'm having an issue with a work friend or family member, you know, that's kind of ruling my head. And it's, you know, I put it, write something down, put all the power of that into that and and then put it in my God box. And then it actually really helps take away certain things and you just have some acceptance and, and just hand it over. And then if you have that kind of horrible, icky energy block where you're feeling, you know, my best friend Zoe, she's a brilliant woman and she always helps with all this stuff. Stuff. And, you know, really, if I'm feeling that trapped negative energy is to um, do tapping. Tapping's really good, really works. Do you need to know how to do that? 
I think you can go on YouTube and do it, but she's taught me how to do it. And it literally, if I have anxiety or I'm wound up or whatever I am or frustrated with one of my kids or somebody, I, I mean, I just start doing that and it, and it really does work. So I think there's a natural, it's just unblocking energy. I, I'd like to do a proper course on it because I think it really helps. Add that to your courses. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you're ever going to get to the point where you're doing nothing, honestly. It's no. never going to happen. I'll, I'll bake the cakes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I do love the sound of the God box. Like you get an annoying email or an annoying text and you just reply. It's my God box. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, so you decorate them how whatever your God is and then put the little things in and put little messages in here of things I've written. That is kind of like two like mini crates, isn't it, with two doors? Yeah, and basically you go back afterwards and you look at like... <laughs> Yeah. oh my god I wasted all afternoon being upset by that that was crazy it's back to that waste of life thing isn't it all those things that you just mm. spend time worrying about that you just can't work out why you did when you look back on it I know. nuts mm. completely crazy I'm going to ask you the questions that I always ask what's your emotional age 15 <laughs> mm. no it's not especially when it comes to my um my daughter Iris I feel like I'm a teenager <laughs> I think we're both like that, but I think that we're both actually, sometimes we're about 70 and then we switch to 10 year olds. You know, it, I don't think there is one age. My kids say I'm the most immature person they know. No, you, you're very mature in so many ways. I, I respect you a lot, Sadie. Oh, Do you think you're more in touch with your teenage you as you've got older? I've just always felt felt very stuck there. You know, I've done a lot of therapy on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm definitely more in touch with me now. Right. Can you recommend that's either made an impact on you or you just love it or you're always recommending? It can be anything at all. I'm not really an avid reader. I'm a terrible reader. I like Audible more. But, that's um, fine. But um, I would say like my favorite ever book is Jane Eyre. I just I have read that a few times and I absolutely love it. But on a sort of like, you know, what makes you feel good type book, it's quite funny, really. But I was given the book The Four Agreements. And because I'm a terrible reader, I kind of just read the back <laughs> <laughs> or, or the summary, rather. I'll just read it to you quickly. It's four agreements. And um, one is be impeccable with your word. Two, don't take anything personally. Three, don't make assumptions. Four, always do your best. I'll tell you what, I haven't read the book, but those four quotes are things that I always go back to. I've kept the book and I keep looking at those four quotes because I tr try and remind myself to do those four things. That's all you need, isn't it? What about you, Sadie? Um, yeah, a lot of people live by that book and a lot of people have done really well in business from that book. And um, I'm the same. I like the agreements, but and I've had it on Audible and read it many times. But I'm still like, just hurry up and get there. Why don't you just tell me the four? Why do you have to keep going? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel like you know the four just by reading the cover. You're really yeah. <laughs> drawing this out. But anyway, I love books like um, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier and Wuthering Heights and Breakfast at Tiffany's. But I, I love reading so much and I don't get enough time in the sense that I'm reading scripts. So my heaven is just reading a book. Great. What advice would you give younger women? To be true to yourself. Well, I was going to say and always be truthful. And I think also enjoy your young youth. Really enjoy it because it's amazing how much time I used to spend criticizing myself and I wish I didn't yeah don't take anything for granted I think I spend a lot of time when so does uh, France with her daughter and um, my daughter and her friends and you know and the insecurities they have remind me of the insecurities I have and I'm just like don't take this for granted enjoy this you know and there's a lot of um, liberation and strength in this generation now that I don't think I had as a teenager. I do see there being progress and, you know, their insight and their maturity and their voice. They have a much stronger voice than I ever had. I never spoke out. So I think to just, yeah, be truthful and, and speak out and be who you are. It definitely does feel like they put up with a lot less shit than we did. Absolutely. They really, yeah. yeah. Who is your old bird role model? Vivian Westwood. Yeah, you know, we both say that, and um, I love her to death. And she, uh, she just uh, was in my documentary, and she was fantastic. And I've known her since I was sixteen. Helen Mirren as well, and my mum, Sylvia Young. She literally is a successful woman who came from absolutely nothing. Mm. Amazing woman. 
What's she doing now? How is she, how old is she now? She's still, she's eighty one, and she's still working, and she's also writing her biography, which is lovely. Oh, that'll be something. Yeah. Uh, what's your superpower? Surviving on two two hours sleep a night. <laughs> That's pretty much a superpower. <laughs> oh God, it really is. I don't know <laughs> what is my superpower, Sadie. Um, your. I have one. Do I have any? I guess my superpower is, yeah, husky singing. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, how many fucks do you give? Right now, I don't give any fucks. But then this morning, I did give quite a few fucks. <laughs> Had a little argument with somebody and I got very upset. And then and then it was just like that whole thing of just letting it go. And so I don't really give a fuck right now. You, you can work through anything and, and yeah. I want to say I don't give a fuck because I don't care about what other people think about me. Um, but I do give a fuck because I don't want to upset people in their lives. I don't want to say the wrong thing that's going to upset someone. But I also um, have to be truthful as well. So, so yes, I do give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quality fucks, maybe. Yeah. yeah. As opposed yeah. to not wasted fucks. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got there in the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I quite fancy coming and living in your Indian bungalow. Oh, on your yeah. old birds you get three of them <laughs> yeah <good. laughs> we'll send you a postcard and come over and see us <laughs> yeah <laughs> when we're all allowed to travel again thank you so much thank you thank you bye thank you for listening I'd love to hear your feedback you can reach me on Twitter at Sam Baker and Instagram at the other Sam Baker using the hashtag the shift you can hear a new episode of the shift each Tuesday on Acast Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate and subscribe because it really does help other people find us. <laughs>